Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Space Tourism. It's been a little while. In the previous episode of this series, we went to Val, and with us we took our artificial gravity merry-go-round, completely ignoring the problems that we were experiencing in the episode before that on Lathe, where our landing refueling program didn't quite go to plan. So here we are, bringing back a little bit of nostalgia again for the second consecutive episode with our moon base, rather than our artificial gravity. So this is the Dractech Moon Attractor, submitted by Dractech for the moon base back when we were doing that series. And it makes me think about doing that series again. Well, not exactly that series, but doing something similar, doing some sort of viewer-submitted modules and bringing them together into one kind of thing. Now, the Stractech Moon Rover was extremely useful on the moon base. We used it for a wide variety of things, from tipping over transport vessels to... Uh, no, that was about it, actually. We tipped things over because, as you can see on the front, it's got two landing gear. Unfortunately, there are various problems with it, including the fact that it wasn't really designed for driving along a bumpy terrain, and it rides quite low to the ground. So I'm kind of just messing around having myself a little bit of fun here, trying to break things apart and... Ooh, look, there's explosions. And I wonder what will happen if I detach the front bumper and get more explosions. And just kind of testing it out, because it's been a little while. I haven't used this for a very long time. The Moonbase, the Moonbase series happened... Crikey, when did the Moonbase series happen? It was a while ago, whenever it was. So anyway, brought this thing back. And of course, it you, it was a while ago, and therefore it was in a older version of Kerbal Space Program. Which means that the parts have changed. Specifically, the landing legs on the front, which were used for flipping over those different things, have changed. Now they no longer flip on a hinge system, but they are telescopic, and so we have to do some editing. Allow me to present the Dractech Moon Rover Mark III, which has changed a lot of things, but still uses the same cockpit without the interior. Seriously, squad, what are you doing? Why, why haven't we got that interior yet? We really, really want it. Please. Please, can we just have it? Thank you. So, yes, changed a few things. I've increased the... Oh, I've not increased, I've changed the wheels. Increased the height that the Dractech Moon Rover now drives off of the ground. Added on a few action groups, which it turns out aren't working properly, so only one of the gear are responding. And, yeah, those gear at the back. You may be looking at them if you haven't watched that Moonbase series. You should totally watch it. If you haven't watched that Moonbase series, you may be looking at them and going, what are they for exactly? Well, the idea was that they would tip up the back end of the craft and so tip the front end of the craft forwards and get the landing legs closer to the ground so they could slot underneath parts in order to flip them up. And it's really quite cool. Now, today I want to do a little bit of talking about the charity Kerbal Polar Expedition and in, in particular... I want to talk about the design of the rover, because building rovers in KSP isn't something that I'm particularly great at. I haven't had a lot of practice. I didn't even build this, I just edited someone else's. So there's a lot of interesting different techniques that you can use with building rovers. The rover we used for the Kerbal Polar Expedition, our first annual Kerbal Polar Expedition, one of one so far, uh, was designed for its aesthetic more so than its actual functionality. I wanted to make something that Kerbals could sit inside using command modules, uh, command, using command seats rather than command modules, so that you can actually see them reacting to it. And we may have to work on our landings a little bit. So, how do you maintain that kind of interior space without using so many panels that the game lags for the entirety of the journey and, oh god, all sorts of other problems associated with it bending and twisting and falling over and scraping the bumper. Yeah, the bumper was a bad idea. Had a bumper, just like we do on this Dractech Moon Rover, or we did before I stripped it off, as you can see. We launched, we did our turn, we dropped our stages, and now we're circularizing into orbit. And these, this new version may have changed a few things. 
but it has not changed its back to landing legs, which or landing gear, which are quite useful for rover design, and it's something I think we'll be implementing into our next charity drive. I like that. I've only just thought about that, actually. The charity drive? Get it? Charity drive? As in, a charity drive normally is a drive, a motivation, trying to get people to donate, driving the idea of donating to charity. Our one is a charity drive. Because we're driving to the North Pole. Oh, it's funny if you didn't laugh, then you're a heartless person. Oh, really, I don't have not a lot to talk about in this episode. I'm just kind of inventing things off the cuff. But yes, landing gear. You can use them, use them for all sorts of things. Not least, you can use them for landing, oddly enough. When in conjunction with rovers, and you're landing from a great height, say if you're entering the atmosphere of a lathe, then you can extend them if you have some uh, within and behind and inside the arches of your regular rover wheels. You can extend them upon landing because they have a greater impact tolerance than the tyres do. So anyway, getting out, actually talking a little bit about the mission now, we strap this thing on top of a massive rocket and we actually succeed. Because it is so light, we succeed in using the launch stage to get it all the way on an intercept with Jewel. And in fact, we edit the launch stage uh, as the launch stage's trajectory in order to send it crashing down into the gas giant to try and reduce that space litter. You can see there the inner path crossing those orbits there is going straight into the clouds. Our orbit is going straight towards Lathe. Let's see if the landing gear within the rover wheel arches are going to help us out at all. Now there's a fantastic little software, a little online piece of software that I've been using a lot very regularly now, and it's called the KSP Aerobraking Calculator. Some of you may be aware of ksp.olex.biz, which is a interplanetary transfer calculator. Well, this is an aerobraking calculator. You put in your orbital velocity, your altitude currently, your current periapsis on the planet, and your desired apoapsis after aerobraking into orbit and it calculates what periapsis you need to be deep enough into the atmosphere that the aero resistance, that the air resistance, it will slow you down enough so that you are below escape velocity and you maintain an orbit. Previously, before that kind of thing came along, or at least before I knew about it, I was simply having potluck, trying to guess based on experience exactly how low I'd have to go into the atmosphere to slow down sufficiently, but with this I can do it first time, more or less. So, we do get out to leave, we do slow down using our calculated or periapsis on within the atmosphere, do a couple of orbital laps to bring the night side away from where we want to land so that the daylight will allow us a little bit of visibility. I know my videos can be quite dark, I've realised that, in the, especially in the past few episodes of uh, Career Mode, when it, we're on the dark side of the planet, it really is the dark side. It's very much a Sith. Darth Vader and all that. Anyway, yeah, so I don't know what it is. I think it's my... It doesn't, it doesn't look like that in-game, as you can probably guess. I think it's my editor. It likes to boost the gamma or something. I don't pretend to know much about video editing. I know enough to create videos of this quality that you're watching right now. I wonder, what the what is the best quality of editing I've ever done? I'm not entirely sure, actually. Because it was only recently that I started using pan and crop and all that nonsense and... And uh, chroma, chroma keying, chroma keying, chroma keying, to cancel out the background and get transparent background on the video. That's very cool. Use that for my intro. See, it's very, very cool. But regardless, we are now landing down with our landing gear open to try and cushion the blow. Going to tip our nose up so that we do land m primarily on those back engines, also burning at the same time to slow us down and none of our tires break. It is quite nice like that. So, what are we going to do now? Well, it is now time for us to drive all the way over to our base. Because unfortunately, despite the fact that we do have a calculator for error breaking into orbit, we don't yet have a calculator for a precisely landing. I mean, I think you pretty much have to do it based on experience, because there are so many variables associated with landing. It's easier on airless bodies. On bodies with atmosphere, you have to account for not only your 
you know, how how far away, how how far you're going to let air resistance pull you back with your lateral velocity, but also you've got to remember your vertical velocity, which if you is high enough, say if you're the difference between coming in from interplanetary space and coming in from orbit, the difference in vertical velocity heading straight down towards the surface means that you'll get a differing reduction in speed from the atmosphere. And you'll end up with different amounts of delta V loss. Delta V loss? Change in velocity loss? No, it's just change in velocity, surely. Different amounts of delta V. We use delta V as a... Essentially as a... I don't know. Like, a requisite amount in order to go somewhere. Oh, you want to go to the moon? Well, you need 1k of delta V from low Earth orbit, or low Kerbin orbit. We use it... I guess it's a branch way. I guess it's... Very simplistically, delta V is simply a measurement of how effective your craft is at moving through space. Now, of course, it gets a bit more complicated than that because you've got the whole deal with low transfer... Uh, low transfer orbits... No, low energy transfer, that's it. Low energy transfers and high energy transfers, which we'll be doing in the next episode. For the first time on video, I think, I'm going to be doing a high energy transfer, and it works, I pull it off fine. So, yeah, you've got that to look forward to. We're going to be going back to Val in the next episode, and it's going to be quite interesting. Anyway, enough of my rambling. Let's go back to the video. Let's actually have a look here. So, we have got our lathe-bound plane, Dave the Custom Refueler, this thing that we're currently driving, and now we have the Dractec version 3. Now, the idea... The reason that we brought this out here, because I kind of didn't explain that, was, as you may have guessed or inferred from what I said, to tip the Dave the Custom Refueler, to tip him over, to press his docking port down onto the docking port of the plane. Because, of course, we have all the problems with how the docking port isn't low enough, so we're going to try and do that. Bringing the Muna Rover in, opening up the back landing gear to try and push it down far enough, we are just below the lip, we can flex those massive landing gears. And you can see that the docking port, just look at it there. Look at it, man. How is that not docked? I simply didn't understand. Now I think I maybe do. Perhaps it's the fact that if you are close to a docking port, and... No, because if you haven't docked yet, then the magnetism should continue. Maybe, maybe it's something to do with the magnetism being... Activated when you're close, and then if you go to the space center and then return or something, the magnetism is halted, it's paused, so that you can maneuver correctly without it affecting you. Because currently, it seems like there is no magnetism going on whatsoever between those docking ports. They are so close! There's enough flex in the in the strut there, for surely that the magnetism would be allowed to push or pull those two things together. I think there's a complete lack of magnetism whatsoever. So what I probably should have done at this point in time was actually reversed the custom refueler, brought it back and then brought it back in so that there is enough space between them for the magnetism to reactivate. Yeah, I think, I think I didn't quite think this through. How long have we been doing this? Not in this video, I mean in this actual series, like... We we've put we've spent so many resources on actually bringing things here to try and deal with this lathe-bound plane. It would have been far easier to actually just bring a new lathe-bound plane. I just don't like the idea of it sitting here being useless. I think that's the crux of it. I don't want anything on the ground that is basically you know it could work. I don't want anything here to be useless. We might as well fix it. It would be nice to do this kind of thing. And it means that we don't just simply build something and then go to a body and then land and do science and then come back. Space tourism, I've always tried to make it a bit more than just going somewhere and coming back. Actually doing operations down on the ground like this is, as I've said, what I think makes a good series. So we're getting closer to and closer to the end of the video. I've managed to successfully push one of our Kerbals underneath the wing, the left wing of the lathebound plane, to try and prop it up to get closer and closer to the docking port, but yeah, it's probably not going to work because I don't think there's any magnetism. And even if you push the docking ports perfectly together without that magnetism, 
the force applied by the game, I don't think it's going to work. So Noodles Kerman is here. We swapped briefly back to our Dave the Custom Refueler to try and do this again. I think the idea now... Uh, yes, right, we've got a Kerbal under one of the wings, and we haven't quite got a Kerbal under the other one, it's too close to the ground. If only we could lift one of those wings higher up. Oh wait, we can! So instead of tipping Dave the Custom Refueler to try and bring it down to the plane, we tip the plane up to try and bring it up to the refueler. Hey, this utility, this utility here is quite versatile. And that's all, that's the crux of it, isn't it? That's the crux of cool things like this in Kerbal Space Program. Versatility. Using one module for several different purposes. That's why bases are cool. Despite the fact there's no actual in-game system that... There's no reason to do a base, it doesn't benefit you in any way. Actually, yeah, genuinely, I genuinely can't think of any way that a base of any sort in the game is currently an advantage to you. Apart from refueling, having space stations in orbit so that you can refuel your crafts, I suppose that's cool. But in terms of getting science, it really doesn't help. It's just nice to have a permanent settlement somewhere because of the challenge of actually doing it. Well, as you can see, we managed to completely push the plane out of the way, out from underneath the docking port. And now it's time to fight, trying to try one final thing, something that people were screaming at me to do, but I was sure wouldn't... Oh, it worked. Well, balls, that could have been helpful earlier. Now, there was no electricity in the craft, so I was determined. I was determined that you wouldn't be able to control any of the features of the plane without electricity. I've had it so many times, and I'm sure you have too, where you've been controlling something, you've run out of electricity, and even though you've got Kerbals in there, you can't do anything, you can't turn, you can't turn the engines on in order to generate more electricity, there's nothing you can do. But, apparently, you can open up the landing gear without electricity. So, all this time, we could have just done that. Unfortunately, though we could have just done that, it doesn't seem to actually help. Not even slightly. Oh, all the time. I swear we must have spent at least, like, four hours now just focusing on trying to get this thing refueled. And we don't even need it refueled. We're gonna have to do something about this situation, ladies and gentlemen. Something drastic. Something in a couple of episodes' time. Because the next episode, as we shall swap to now, is going to be not on lathe. Because, of course, of course, we have moved on to Val! Here it is, with our merry-go-round situated nicely on the surface of this ice, barren, icy landscape. Now, we haven't been having much luck with our VTOL idea. The idea was, you know, build the scaffolding, have it all as one thing, nice and compact, quite, not modular, just, you know, quite compact, all one together, one thing. And then to just slot it, to slot it neatly, down on top of one of these stone monuments things. That plan didn't go so well because, hey, it's a VTOL on low, in low gravity with very little control authority. Seriously, we're using a probe. Actually, no, we do have a command module, so we do have some sort of reaction wheels, but it just isn't working particularly well. So we're gonna have to give up with the VTOL idea and do something much more interesting in the next episode. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching this episode of the Kerbal Space Program Space Tourism. We will be back with something quite remarkable. Damn! Damn! How can I not get that word right? Ugh. If you liked the video, please do like the video. Thank you very much for watching, and I shall see you all next time.